Hello, friends. I am happy to be worshiping with you today. Pastor Phil Hunter, Citrus Grove Church, Wesley Chapel, Florida. We're going to focus on one psalm out of the Bible. Crack open your Bible to the middle, open up your app, get to 92, close to the middle of the middle. Uh, you're going to hear some words of encouragement, uh, particularly about your, your worship and about your attitude toward God, your fruitfulness. Um, I pray that God will bless you through it, move you to repent of the times that you've blown it, that you've been wasteful, that you've been lazy, that you've been half-hearted, but that you would find comfort and encouragement as Jesus washes away what you've done wrong and covers you with purity and sends you out with purpose. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Feel free to use any of the materials in the description below this video. Sing the songs or click play and let them wash over you. Uh, flip through the worship guide to grab some, um, some words of encouragement, some notes about our ministries and upcoming events. There's a link to give an offering online and uh, contact infor information for me as well. Well, let's look at that psalm that I just mentioned to you. 92 is the number. I'll introduce it to you this way. If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? That question has been such a cliche ever since Barbara Walters asked it to Audrey Hepburn back in 1981. And you've now had plenty of opportunity to think up some funny answer if you ever get asked that in a job interview. That's where it kind of comes up now. Psalm 92 asks and answers that question though and it's basically the same question that Jesus raised to his disciples in John 15 when he talks about the vine and the branches and it's basically the mission statement for our church here too. It's also the question that whether you want to phrase it that way or not it's what you want to get answered it's what you hope to find an answer to every time you open up your Bible and every time you come to worship Every time you click play on one of these worship videos, you are asking that question. If, if I were a tree, what kind of tree would I be? Well, let's, let's see what we mean by that. Look at Psalm 92. First of all, it starts out like this. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. We start out with some light in instrumental musician talk. Musicians are always talking about their instruments, buying upgraded instruments, check out my new 10 string, what model harp is that? And as someone with more guitars than I have hands or talent to play guitar, uh, I know that non-musicians aren't nearly as impressed with that kind of talk. They zone out pretty fast. If you don't play an instrument, you just don't want to listen to that. But don't zone out on this psalm, even though it starts out by talking about the different instruments you can use to praise God. This is not a fluffy psalm, uh, you know, like a song with a good beat, but no message. Praise without a reason to praise, it, it gets tiring. Big emotion with no explanation for why you have all that emotion, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Uh, psalms are really good about taking care to explain why it is so good to pick up your guitar and write a new song to praise the Lord uh, or, or, or why you would walk from your house to your synagogue every Sabbath or why you would make a weekly habit uh, uh, of coming to Pinecrest Academy or clicking on this video making a habit of it and, and wanting to be around other Christians what what drives you to that you need reminders why, otherwise you quickly start to yourself ask, why bother? Why am I doing this? In verse 2, you already get a couple reasons why, uh, God's, why God is worth your time, your attention, your worship, and your praise. Two reasons in verse 2, his love and his faithfulness. In a wedding service, the couple usually exchanges rings and they say to one another, receive this ring as a symbol of my 
love and faithfulness. The same words here. Can you have one without the other? Love without faithfulness makes big promises but can't keep them all. Faithfulness without love would be scary, be unapproachable. Combine the two, though, in a friendship or a marriage or in a God. And his people have life good. <laughs> Promises are made and kept. He sticks with it, even through hard times, love and faithfulness. And it's great. You'll never see love and faithfulness combine in one person as clearly and consistently as in Jesus. He came from his Father full of grace and truth, love and faithfulness. That's John 1. He's worth singing about. I wonder if we could get our, uh, our, our Bible study groups or maybe our, our different neighborhoods that we live in to, to write their own songs about God's love and his faithfulness. And then we could sing them all together and see who wrote the best new song about Jesus' love and faithfulness. You think so? Verses 4 and 5 list four more reasons it's worth worshiping and singing and playing and praying to our God. Verse 4 says, You make us glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord. How profound your thoughts. It can be summed up in his works and his thoughts. The Israelites had, had seen quite the spectacle, hadn't they, over the years? Pick just about any chapter of the Old Testament, pick any generation in the Old Testament era, and there's some miracle that God is doing for the people that he chose from among the nations to send his, his, his son, our Savior, through. He's either moving nature around, he's prophesying the future, and, and between those extraordinary spectacles, He's also working and showing his thoughts to his people in the ordinary deeds and handiwork that he brings to provide and care for his people too. Even the way that he thinks about the bigger picture than we can see, looks over the horizon and, and can plan things out for us and work and rearrange and guide. The ancient believers who sang this song had plenty of God's work in their lives. They'd seen it. And just thinking about the things they'd seen God do and think about for them, that was a reason to sing. But don't you have a big advantage here? Haven't you seen lots more of God's work than the Israelites ever did? You have more pages in your Bible. Just for, for starters, you have more years of history to look back on. And you have a clearer revelation of, of the thoughts of God. You've seen his words and his promises take flesh and shock the world by dying, by rising. You've seen uh, uh, Jesus, so you can sing very specifically about who the Messiah is and what he has done. In short, we, we Christians have lots more material to pour over when we gather and thank, uh, things to praise the Lord about. There's no shortage of the works of God. And if your well is running dry, well, God's given you a deep blue sea of promises kept and faithfulness drenched in love. Now let's talk about why you might not gather on a Sunday or might not write a song praising Jesus. I can think of one good logical, well, it's not a good reason, but it's a logical reason. If you don't know his thoughts, or his works, or his love, or his faithfulness. If you don't know that God's attitude toward you is grace, always grace. If you don't know the works that uh, a real Jesus really miraculously did for you, and, and know that those acts are real, and they really count, and they really are important for your real eternal future. If you don't know about that, why would you bother? 
Really, seriously. Verse 6 uh, of Psalm 92 goes on, Senseless people do not know. Fools do not understand. That though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are forever exalted. For surely your enemies, Lord, surely your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured over me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard of the rout of my wicked foes. The hardwired mentality that sinful kids get from their sinful parents, it's missing a crucial piece of hardware. You want to make sense of the world and the causes of good and evil, but your menu of options is just so limited. You got, you got maybe it's all chaos, maybe there's karma, maybe there's fate, maybe it's my choices or somebody else's choices, or maybe it's just unexplainable. We are simply unable to guess God's grace. His thoughts remain a mystery to us. Nature remains beautiful and strong and amazing. Things happen around you, but you're limited by a false presupposition that none of this can possibly be from a God who loves me and thinks about me and acts to benefit little me. That's how unbelief can be both foolish and completely reasonable. Is your reaction one of sympathy, then, like it should be? Of wanting your friends to know God's thoughts about them and understand, and even wanting your enemies to know and understand how much love and faithfulness Jesus has already shown them, shown everyone. How before it made sense to any of us, or we could object, it doesn't make any difference. He was stooping down to raise up senseless fools, and exalt us to his side. Jesus makes it make sense. He puts it in terms of, of battling enemies to, to, to help it make sense. So maybe you think about it like that. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, he routed some enemies. Like who? Death? The devil? When God drowned your sinful nature in baptism, he beat an enemy that day, so that it doesn't rule you, although it still rears its ugly head. One day, Jesus will save you from having to do battle every day. He'll give you a, uh, he'll give a final boot to those enemy instincts inside of you, and you'll wear a victor's crown in glory. Glory that he won for you, and then he just gives you for free. Now let's talk about trees. The, the Psalms have poetic license to change the scene with no transition at all. Uh, there is a tiny little mention of grass, maybe you picked up on earlier. Grass in that battlefield uh, of people in kind of a rat race to see who can be the tallest blade of grass above the other blades of grass. It's a foolish competition. Listen to this promise. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. We're contrasting hayfields and orchards. They have different purposes and different lifespans. Grass and groves. And here it's clear, God has greater plans for you than to be a blade of grass, racing and competing for temporary bragging rights. His plans are much bigger, much more productive, but they take a lot longer, too. You're a tree that he planted in his house. He's willing to play the slow game with you. And because you are one tree planted in his house, Jesus' church, together, is a grove of trees. You are not in it alone. Wherever two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, whether in your home, in a gym, in a sanctuary, in a hotel conference room, in a cafeteria like we use here, uh, one tree by itself does not an orchard make. A grove, by definition, is a group of trees growing together. 
So what kind of tree, I'll ask once again, would you be? In that interview, Audrey Hepburn said that she would like to be an oak tree, and she guessed that everyone else would say the same thing too, because oaks are strong and pretty. Not a bad answer. In fact, a different Bible verse says Jesus turns hopeless people into oaks of righteousness that show his splendor. That's Isaiah 61. But in this psalm, we start out as palm trees. Yes, we have them around here. They're nice and a symbol of, uh, of the tropics, and they're relaxing and beautiful. But they're tough, too. They're spiky all over. They chew up your trimming equipment. And when the British attacked Fort Moultrie, South Carolina, the cannonballs bounced right off the palm tree logs. That's God's goal for a tree like you. Trees like your kids and your grandkids. Be like a palm tree. Be like that. Or maybe the other type uh, that he mentions there is a cedar. You smell nice. More than that, you're high quality. You resist rot. You resist bugs. And you make a beautiful temple or a solid treasure chest. Well, there's a third kind of tree described at the end here. It's not named, but it's a type of tree described uh, uh, as, as not just strong, and not just surviving, not just pretty, not just thriving. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tree that is productive and providing. It's a fruit tree. Jesus put it really simple one time. Good trees bear good fruit. What does that look like for you? Well, when Jesus plants you, and pours his love and his faithfulness into you, he makes you both productive and beneficial. That's fruitfulness in his book. Personally, you get the joy of being productive. Isn't that what we all crave? You're productive, you produce, you do what God created you to do. But you're also beneficial. It's not just about you. Other people benefit, and maybe they even get healthier because of the fruit that you give them even into old age, because fruit is always new, however old the tree or the vine. Whatever the flavor or the color of the fruit that God produces in you, how it grows is kind of an open secret. It grows because you're planted in the Lord's house, where you're within earshot of his word, and you're regular, regularly watered with reminders of God's deeds and his thoughts, and his faithful love for you. Did uh, you ever see a church with a green roof or a green wall or, like us, a green logo? I think the symbolism is, is pretty obvious there. Why would a church involve green? Well, because green stuff is, is growing. It's a constant, it's a silent reminder as you, you drive by and you see it, or you notice our logo on something, you, you think about uh, coming to church or being part of a church, you think of that green. And that green is a little subtle reminder that the way to stay fresh and green and fruitful, even through old age, is to sink down your roots into God's word and soak up his love and his faithfulness. Yes, it is so good to gather as a grove and praise the Lord together. Amen. The peace of God passes all our understanding, but may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. I'll be praying for you uh, and for your family to stay rooted and close and growing and fruitful. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.